let's uh, let's kick things off, right? Let's get the first speakers onto the stage. We've got um, uh, Liz and Saul from uh, Deloitte, and uh, let's bring them onto the stage. And here they are. Hi, guys. How are you doing? You're, you're both in Australia, if I'm uh, correct, right? Hi, Aaron. That's yes, we are. Hi there. Right, right. So you've moved on from the coffee stage uh, a long time ago. So uh... <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Right. excellent. So, uh, what, what are you speaking about today? So we're talking about growing an API culture, how to overcome some of the barriers to API-first development that you might find in many enterprises uh, these days. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good good topic, yeah. Do you wanna go ahead and share your slides and then uh, I'll leave you to it. Okay. All right, you're looking good. Right, okay. Okay. Um, Terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Liz Douglas and I'm one of the partners in our platform engineering practice here in Deloitte, Australia. Hi, and I'm Saul Kagoff, uh, a principal in Deloitte, Australia. So um, our talk today is split into three parts. In part one, we look at some common problems and anti-patterns that we see today in many of the enterprises that we work with. Um, in part two, we imagine what a better model for API-led integration might look like. And then in part three, we look at some techniques for achieving that better model within an enterprise. So, First of all, what's the problem that we see? Uh, within platform engineering, we specialize in enterprise integration and we work with dozens of different clients across a, a range of industries, all of them with different levels of digital maturity. And we see a number of common threads um, in, in how these organizations are trying to uh, reinvent themselves for the digital world. So the common thread is that uh, all of these organizations want to deliver technology faster and at reduced cost. Um, and we're in the position where we can see many different responses to this challenge. And what we find is there are common anti-patterns that emerge from those responses. So the first type of challenges that we see are what we call bottlenecks. And this occurs when teams are waiting for their APIs to be implemented. And often this happens because they have a dependency on a centralized team. Or alternatively, it can occur because either there's some shared infrastructure that they're constrained by, or alternatively, because they're simply weighed down by technical debt. And we often see uh, a behavior that we call silos. So this is where you see duplicate APIs, lots of slightly different copies of the same API doing essentially the same thing. Maybe within your organization, you might be able to count how many get customer APIs of various flavors do you see? We also see organizations struggling to achieve the reuse and the cost savings um, that they would get through uh, properly designed APIs. And the third class of anti-patterns that we see is about contention. And in this instance, we're talking about contention between versions. So either we have um, the same domain e expressed through lots of APIs, as Saul said, something like a get customer or customer API is a common one. Or we see um, the expression of the domain in the API really changing rapidly. So churning of the versions. And it's important to note that these anti-patterns arise regardless of the technologies being used um, in the API program. Um, so many of these organizations, they've got their API gateways, they've got their developer portals, they're using microservices, they're 
uh, automating all of the develop, DevOps things. Um, all of those techniques and technologies are helpful, but they're not necessarily sufficient for success. Very true. So um, on this slide, across the top, we've got the common symptoms or anti-patterns that we commonly see. And in thinking about how this pro these problems come about, um, we decided to do some mapping. So in the first instance, we, we were working out what are some intermediate causes of some of these symptoms? And initially we came up with two, one around ownership and one around durability. So by ownership, we mean um, that nobody really takes uh, takes possession or thinks about um, these assets as, as long-term APIs. And it can occur because there's dependencies um, that, that are happening across different teams. And in the instance of durability, we're referring there to the attention span or the ability of the team to evolve a product over time. If we just jump to the next slide, thanks all. Yes, thank you. Um, and then we thought we thought about um, another couple of intermediary causes around a lack of prioritization of a roadmap. So where um, different teams are not planning or collaborating over shared assets effectively. And, and the final intermediate cause around a lack of visibility of the shared assets, both what's in production already and also what's being planned or already under development. So we went a step further and we decided that there's really two sort of root causes, if you like, of these uh, of these types of issues. So ownership and durability are driven really by the level of autonomy that the teams have, which in turn is mostly driven, we decided, by the delivery model that's used. And the challenges around roadmaps and visibility are driven by how different teams achieve alignment across the broader organisation, which ultimately is dictated by the governance model which is used. So this, um, these kind of two dimensions of autonomy and alignment is reminiscent of the way that Spotify had talked about the relationship between team autonomy and organisational alignment and how technology teams need both of these attributes in order to move faster in the same direction. And we can overlay this diagram from an inter integration perspective and see a similar pattern happening in organisations. So most organisations that we speak to are in the top left-hand quadrant. Uh, organisations in this quadrant typically have a fairly traditional approach to integration and a centralised team that does the integration work. And they have, by virtue of the fact that the teams, for the most part, maybe pre-COVID, uh, sit together, they have um, the ability to discover what is available and they also often have a high degree of consistency but they also often are a bottleneck in their organisation, which is one of the symptoms that we spoke about just a moment ago. Yes, um, the centralised integration factory is a great way to get consistency in your uh, integration techniques, uh, but it often becomes a scaling bottleneck. And when it fails to scale, organisations respond by trying something different and they might try to disband the factory and uh, and move integration into the province of small, loosely uh, cross-functional teams. Uh, and that means they, they kind of jump from the top left quadrant in our diagram down to the bottom right quadrant where we have a lot of autonomy. So teams have self-determination and autonomy, but they lose the cohesiveness uh, of standards and governance. They become disconnected projects. So high autonomy, but low alignment. 
so obviously what we want to get to of course because this is a, a two by two model is the top right hand quadrant and in this state the teams that are working on the apis have both a high degree of domain autonomy as well as durability as well as a high level of governance um, around the boundaries of the domain so how do we get there without getting into this chaos state at the bottom right? So, yes, what does better look like? Okay, let's, uh, let's start by talking about um, what it feels like to be in a better state of work. So one of, one of our favorite books at the moment is a book called Mick Kirsten, which some of you may be familiar with, which is Project to Product. And in that book, um, Mick talks about how you need to balance four types of flow. There's the feature flows where you're building out new capabilities, the defect flows where you're correcting errors, risk mitigation flows where you're proactively preventing issues such as uh, compliance or security issues from occurring in the first instance, and technical debt flow, where you're paying down what you might have accumulated whilst working on the other flow types. And the point that Mick makes in the book is that you have to constantly balance the four flow types. All of them are required and you need to make trade-offs about how much you emphasize one over the other, and that does change over the life cycle of the products. But you must also make sure that none of them ever stagnate completely. So one of the problems we see in the enterprises that we work with is that they're really focused around projects and only projects. Projects are short-term, compartmentalised scope and time uh, they are often uh, focused on just getting things done. Projects really concentrate on two types of flow, which is features and defects. The whole purpose of a project is to deliver more features. And if some of those features are broken, well, you go back and fix it because you have to. But projects are particularly bad at dealing with things like technical debt, which is an important flow type. Projects are also often built around short-term incentives with no consequences for shortcuts. Uh, if you take a shortcut or build up technical debt inside a project, it's not your project that suffers, it's the project after you or the larger enterprise uh, that suffers. And we also find that projects are particularly bad at building reusable assets or using reusable assets like APIs. They don't want to use external assets because that brings in extra dependencies and extra risk. So overall, projects are not very good in their ability to promote durable, reusable assets such as APIs. And this is particularly true in the API space as opposed to some other types of technology, right? So, I mean, you don't see somebody creating lots and lots of different CRMs in an organization, um, but you can see you know, the same API being developed time and time again um, without any other consequences, really. Okay, so the way that we can get to a better place is we think by taking a product thinking approach and teams that are able to do that have the durability so they know exactly from a roadmap what they're going to build and that takes into account what they already have and that's really important not to be rebuilding the same thing all the time. They also know their customers really well and therefore know their domain really well and the domain is able to be expressed really well in APIs. And importantly, the team has a product manager who's in a position to maintain the integrity of the APIs ongoing. Yes, the product manager can stand up for their domain, can shape uh, the demands of their customers uh, and uh, really act to uh, not corrupt the domain. 
So to summarise what we've established so far, we've talked about some API anti-patterns and for the most part that they are driven by both the governance model and the delivery model which is used. And to avoid the common anti-patterns, we are aiming for a governance model that promotes high alignment and a delivery model that's optimised for high autonomy, which is the top right quadrant of the two by two. And we've made the case that the essential element for how to get there is to take a product thinking approach, which you might be thinking, well, that's great, but what does that actually mean? Growing applications into products. Um, so yes, we find that um, it's all very well to come in and say, well, we should give up projects and start thinking about products. But in reality, um, the project methodology or the project paradigm is deeply entrenched in many organisations. It's built up over 30 plus years of uh, application and practice. It ripples into the ways that we think, into our mental models, our con concepts, our business processes, our funding models. So funding models are built around annual cycles and uh, project roadmaps. And it's also built into the organisational structure of our IT organisations. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, we also find that the project approach also affects the way that procurement is done. So in organisations where um, the project paradigm is most prolific, we find that those organisations also tend to be buyers of commercial off-the-shelf software or COT software. And these organisations take an approach to technology where they purchase a COTS product and then do some integration to incorporate it into their organisation. And effectively, um, you know, they're, they're taking an approach whereby they're putting a boundary around the application and then using a systems integrator who could be, you know, any third party really to, um, to wire it all together, which, which impacts how you think about integration. So when we're focused around applications and the boxes that they come in, um, setting up an application might be the, the domain of one um, uh, provider and then integrating that application into other areas is the domain of the systems integrator. We end up drawing lines between boxes. So uh, delivering integration becomes a thing that you do, a project that you have to run, an obligation rather than something with inherent value. And this makes it difficult to create durable, reusable APIs as assets. Yeah, absolutely. And lots of things effectively end up falling between the cracks. So especially in longer term things like uh, like ongoing maintenance um, really become the responsibility of, of nobody. Okay, so how can we flip this model? What can we change? Um, so the best way that we found is to give roadmap responsibility and ownership of the APIs to the asset teams for the APIs that integrate their systems. Um, so asset teams have the benefit of being consistently funded and therefore long lived and are well positioned to take up this responsibility. They also often have the best knowledge of the end users of the systems and therefore um, have an appreciation for their domain and are able to express that domain effectively in APIs. And really in taking this approach, we're effectively expanding the asset boundary outside of just that COTS application boundary, which means that we get the benefits of durability of the APIs, um, a bit of visibility of what's available and therefore more reuse of the APIs as well. So taking, taking the application at the centre of this business domain, the first thing we want to do is to expand the application boundaries to form a broader business domain encompassing the APIs that we want to build to access the data and the functionality within the application. 
So these domain capabilities or domain services are then expressed via business level APIs and event stream. Our original applications still reside within these business domains. They're often the core of the business domain. So the CRM may be the core of a customer uh, management domain. Um, but they become augmented by other moving pieces, by applications and microservices, which might take care of other concerns like customization or internal integrations. And these tightly controlled domain boundaries become a scaffold for other activities you want to do, such as modernization of the monolithic applications which live within the domain. By uh, controlling access to these uh, data and functions across the boundaries. You can only access the data through APIs or event streams. That means you can then start to modernize internally um, without uh, by and minimizing the disruption that might occur in other parts of the organization outside of the domain. So zooming out to our bigger picture, we find this kind of working model that we have of a more modern enterprise where business domains are expressed via services um, through APIs and event streams, uh, uh, leveraging internal capabilities, including microservices and monoliths, etc. Those services are expressed out through channel APIs to product channels. Um, the product channels uh, are where your customers, your employees, your business partners are all um, taking advantage of the services that you deliver. So in doing this, effectively, um, integration is no longer a thing that is done in projects. It is something that emerges from the act of consuming APIs and is a, integration becomes a byproduct of that consumption. Okay, so just to sum up, um, so we started this talk in part one by covering off some common anti-patterns that we see associated with operating in the left-hand side of this matrix and specifically challenges around bottlenecks, silos and contention. In part two, we talked about some of the underlying causes for these issues and proposed that we're aiming to achieve both high alignment and high autonomy, so get to that top right-hand quadrant. We've spoken also about product thinking and how it better positions teams to achieve that top right quadrant um, approach and that a, an achievable way of getting to that space is to have asset teams become the durable owners of their domain APIs. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, you. You were really mad that you with me a lot, you know, from my time working in, in, in various organizations and seeing, you know, projects failing all the time and how they should be doing things with uh, with products. I, I, I have one question for you, and that is, um, are, are you saying that you should take the centralized integration team and break them out into like business domains? Uh, is, is that effectively what you're saying? Uh, yes, to a certain extent. Now, you don't want to break them out completely because you still need that um, the, the, the standards and the best practices and the governance processes around your APIs. So often the centralized integration team becomes a center for enablement. So mm -hmm. they, they, they stop being a bottleneck and just doing and start more guiding and teaching and evangelizing and, and to some extent governing as well. Right, makes sense. Uh, we also had a question from, uh, Arno as well, uh, he says that, you know, inside an organization, it's often hard to make people become good API consumers uh, in the sense of knowing the limits of what you can um, ask an API provider, how to grow this kind of culture. Well, that's it. I think it's, it's largely through um, 
through practice. And what we're trying to do is get to the first part where we have durable teams um, around those, um, those uh, application assets, providing the APIs in a durable way that they can guide the life cycle um, and evolve in response to customer demand. So the problem with project-centric organizations is when you want a change to an API, you go, first of all, try to find who owns the API. That's not always obvious. Second of all, oh, now we need to get funding to make the change because we need to stand up a project to do that. So when you have a durable API owner with a product management mindset, you go to the product management manager and you say, we need this change to the functionality or this additional functionality. And because the product manager has funding um, and at a certain level of autonomy over their funding, they can they can do that if it makes sense for their domain. Mm -hmm. Guys, great. Thanks very much. That was uh, that was perfect. And uh, well, I know it's late there, so uh, go and get yourselves a glass of wine or a beer or something to celebrate. <laughs>